Good morning. Good morning. I know it's a few of us, but we are gathered and we want to show our very best support of our speakers here this morning. So thank you for being here. Uh, I want to just introduce the speakers for our integrative research review panel this morning, and I just want to say that we are delighted to have with us Latrice Johnson to my right. Latrice Johnson is a writer, scholar, mother, teacher, and intellectual. She works as an associate professor of secondary English language arts and literacy at the University of Alabama. She is an equity-oriented scholar whose research examines the literacy practices of historically marginalized youth in and outside of school. Her articles, Writing the Self, Black Queer Youth Challenge Heteronormative Ways of Being in an After School Writing Club, and The Human and the Writer, The Promise of a Humanizing Writing Pedagogy for Black Students, published in Research in the Teaching of English, both received the Alan C. Purves Award for their impact on literacy education. Dr. Johnson serves the literacy field as associate editor of Literacy Research, Theory, Methods, and Practice Journal, as a member of Language Arts, Research in the Teaching of English, and Equity and Excellence in Education editorial boards. She is a past chair of English Language Arts Teacher Education, ELATE. Dr. Johnson was a Cultivating New Voices Fellow in 2010 to 2012 and now co-directs the program. Dr. Johnson teaches yoga to her friends and family, and her anthem is Queen by Janelle Monáe. Welcome, Dr. Latrice Johnson. Our second speaker this morning is Dr. Seth Parsons. Seth is a professor in the Sturvant Center for Literacy in the School of Education at George Mason University. He teaches in the elementary education, literacy, and research methods program areas. His award-winning research focuses on student motivation and engagement, teacher instructional adaptations, and teacher education and development. He is a past president of the Association of Literacy Educators and Researchers, and is, a currently, uh, and is currently a co-editor of the Journal of Literacy Research. His books include Accelerating Learning Recovery for All Students, Core Principles for Getting Literacy Growth Back on Track with Margaret Vaughan, Principles of Effective Literacy Instruction, K-5 with Margaret Vaughan, and Becoming a Co Metacognitive Teacher, a Guide for Early and Pre-Service Teachers with Royal Scales and Thomas Devere Woolsey. Welcome, Dr. Parsons. Our third speaker this morning is the one and only Raul uh, Alberto Mora. <laughs> Dr. Mora, Raul Mora, is an associate professor at the, at the Doctorate in Education at Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana, I am getting there, Raul, in Medellin, where he also chairs the award-winning literacies in Second Languages Project Research Lab, LSLP. During his time in higher education, he has served as visiting professor and scholar at universities in Colombia, Poland, Mexico, Spain, Brazil, the United States, and Norway. His current research explores second language literacies in urban spaces and gaming communities, the pedagogical implementation of alternative literacies in second language education, and the need for critical frameworks for English language teaching and plurilingualism in and from the global south. 
He currently sits on the LRA Board of Directors, is one of the co-founders of the Transnational Critical Literacies Network, and he was recently appointed as co-editor of the Contemporary Perspectives on Semiotics in Education, Science, Meaning, and Multimodality series at Information Age Publishing. He co-edited the Handbook of Critical Literacies and Translanguaging and Multimodality as Flow Agency and a New Sense of Advocacy in and from the Global South, as well as the forthcoming volume, Understanding Second Language Users as Gamers, Language as Victory, under contract with Routledge. Welcome, Dr. Morar. Our fourth and final speaker, but in no way the least, is Dr. Antero Garcia. Antero Garcia is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. His research explores the possibilities of speculative imagination and healing in educational research. Prior to completing his PhD, Garcia was an English teacher at a public high school in South Central Los Angeles. He has authored or edited more than a dozen books about the possibilities of literacies, play, and civics in transforming schooling in America. And Taro currently co-edits La Cuenta, an online publication centering the voices and perspectives of individuals labeled undocumented in the United States. And Taro received his PhD in the Urban Schooling Division of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. Greetings. Thank you so much for those introductions. So my presentation, Write the Power, How Writing Research Can Respond to Hierarchies in Literary Research, evokes the command first made by the Isley Brothers, then turned anthem by Public Enemy. It calls us to fight the powers that be. Writing the Power then offers a way to think about writing as action in response to discrimination. Writing the power within literacy, re literacy research specifically refers to the power literacy researchers have in interrupting stubborn hierarchies that persist. Conversely, it implies that literary research, literacy research has contributed very little to improving literacy equity across several contexts and perhaps at worst, perpetuated social and scientific hierarchies despite our, quote, rigorous research, sophisticated analyses, and strong methods and theories. I pose the following question. How am I implicated in the perpetuation or dismantling of social and scientific hierarchies within my literacy research? As I continued to think with Dr. Tatum's call, I realized that my work alone may not dismantle those hierarchies, but I can respond. And if enough of us respond, then perhaps we can dismantle it together. My research focused primarily on how black youth write themselves into the world. For this presentation, I turn inward to examine my writing the self into literacy research. What I have learned about literacy research and writing, I have learned from, from black writers, great and developing, throughout history and in today's classrooms. Through their experiences and stories, they have responded in writing to racial discrimination and educational injustice, injustice that have long persisted. Writing by black writers, the act of writing, as well as the text produced as a result of formalized inquiry, provides fertile ground for understanding how black people have responded to many lifetimes where their literacy learning has been denied, delayed, disrupted, and diminished. My body of work is a part of an ecology 
where I consider my relationship to the writing and text of other black writers, participants in my studies, and to the places we occupy together. In the following sections, I explore how the characteristics of my writing research are part of a system of black writers writing with the purpose of rewriting the stories that have relegated them to the margins. I lean into black literacy and intellectual legacies that act as my writing ecology where I use writing to connect with and interact with ideas in and through writing. For them, I have learned, from them, I have learned to write the self, to name and claim worlds, and take action by putting pen to paper. I would describe how I have considered particular ideas from writing and research that have allowed me to write the self and write the power as a literary researcher who has grappled with issues of literacy and equity for black youth and offer a conceptual way forward for how literacy researchers might consider their work as part of an ecology system working as one to undo the harmful hierarchies that persist in our field. In response to Walt Whitman's I Hear America Singing, Langston Hughes wrote, I too sing America. He recognized that his story was absent from his story, and he used writing in order to name and claim his place in America. I have wanted to offer counter narratives to what I knew was not the full story. My early research examined the literary li literate lives of black boys. That work was in response to the problematic discourses used to describe their literacy learning and achievement. What I read was not what I had experienced as a teacher or researcher. As a teacher, I have engaged with black boys to understand their multiple experiences and myriad ways that they are. And as a researcher, I have considered, respons considered it responsible to share broader images and ranges of their being and becoming. Zora Neale Hurston, a cultural anthropologist, collected songs and folklore in the South, not as an objective observer, but as a documenter of the everydayness of black life. One of her short stories was published as a young black girl who, who was filled with boundless sense of joy. And that focus on black joy was pretty unusual in 1920s literature, and it's still pretty unusual today. Hurston continued research, conducted research in a way that allowed her to see beauty in the lives of black people. Her work was a reflection of who she was, as my work is a reflection of my being and becoming. Writing the self as a researcher requires a consistent and varied writing practice that includes thinking about the self within the context we study and in the worlds we live. I also want my research and writing to be in a language that reaches people's hearts. As researchers, we joke about the few people who will read our work, but we know that it is not enough. I would like for my work to speak to the people so that I am in conversation within communities and not just about them. In our book, The Mustache Twins, Story and Experience to Love Writing, my co-author sister and I sought to share how we have come to love writing through storying. Storying provides the language to share the ways that I am a writer and researcher, but also daughter, mother, partner, and sister. When writing and researching, I question if what I am saying and how I am saying it brings me closer or distance me from the people and communities I serve and study. In researching and writing with participants in, outside, and on the edge of school, I have found that I must be what Wynn calls a worthy witness to their lives and experiences. I recognize that it is a privilege for participants to share their lives with me and that I have the responsibility in my writing with and about them to share not just what I have observed, but what they have allowed me to witness. While conducting research in and on the edge of schools, I am deliberate in adding to the spaces I occupy. In addition, my presence should have a positive impact on the people there. For example, in my six year long ethnographic study at West High School, I was not only there to do research, I was there to contribute to the community. In addition to working with teachers, students, and administration, I was cheer and flag coach, PTA president, writing club sponsor, creative writing teacher, the list goes on. But most importantly, I was fully present. 
And finally, what of love? I love what I do and I love who I study. Morrison's quote offers a metaphorical grounding for love of black and other bodies, <coughs> the love of self and the love of doing and being. To illustrate love and some of the other characteristics, I share a quick counter story. Josh, a participant in one of my studies at West High School, was put out of his class for brushing his hair. After some guiding questions, I gathered that brushing his hair was not interfering with Josh's ability to complete his work. However, his teachers saw that it was time off task and told him to stop brushing his hair or get out. Josh could not stop, and because he had been a student of mine in my creative writing class, I knew how important not stopping was to him. And if you know and love black hair, black culture, and understand the process of getting waves to appear just right, you know that you have to brush the hair a lot. The process is beautiful if you love coils, waves, braids, and twists, and are able to see your reflection in them, and I did. I equated this black boy brushing his hair as a white girl twirling hers. Josh was put out a lot by Mr. Teacher, by his teacher, and eventually failed history that year. But I knew Josh as a brilliant student who liked to argue his point to the bloody end, who was funny and charismatic, who wrote stories and poems, and who was critical of his teacher, but knew how important school was to his future. But when we do not love, if we cannot see, if we do not hear, when we think we know the whole story, when we are unable to see the beauty in members of particular communities, it becomes easy to write about them in ways that diminish their lives. What I feel is that if we are to truly have social justice for all and undo harmful hierarchies, then we all have to love, to teach love, to write love. Researchers, scholars, activists, all of us, we have to put our hearts into what we do, what we say, what we publish, who we teach, because Morrison reminds us that that is the prize. Here I offer black writing ecologies as a conceptual framing for how I am considering being, becoming, and writing of participants and myself together in order to understand how I view and write myself in relation to the people and communities I study. Each element as individual and collective action work together to create an ecology of writing that represents the many ways that others are writing and have written about the lived experiences of black people in particular within different contexts. Additionally, it illustrates how researchers might center their own being and becoming with participants in order to understand how they fit into the research stories they tell about others. Understanding one's relation to a community to a whole con as a whole connected system recognizes that there are they that we are always writing as a part of something bigger than ourselves as academics we sometimes mistakenly identify the big as tenure or fame among the few but true change can only come from our careful consideration as scholars of the whole story a story that is not outside of us a story in which we should all consider ourselves main characters. Thank you. Thank you for that, Patrice. I really appreciate that uh, beautiful, beautiful talk. It's uh, difficult to follow. It's difficult to be on this panel with such uh, brilliant thinkers. Uh, well, I'm a elementary literacy scholar and researcher. So when I'm out in the schools and when I'm working with others and even the lay community, the science of reading is the first question a lot of people ask me. So when Al reached out to me and invited me to comment on uh, the theme of interrogating hierarchies within literacy research, uh, it, it seemed natural that I would speak about the um, uh, hierarchies within the science of reading movement. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, a brief context just to set the stage, and it is a little tongue in cheek, so it's a cynical nutshell of the current context. So we had a viral podcast about schools and schools of education ignoring the science of reading and teaching reading wrong. 
And then NAEP scores dropped after the pandemic, and this opened the door for states to pass uh, legislation mandating certain curricula and instructional approaches. And that's brought us to where we are today. Um, 32 states in the District of Columbia have passed science of reading legislation as of July. That might be higher as of now. It, it seems to have just taken, taken, uh, taken off across the country. And most of these laws emphasize training for teachers, in-service teachers and pre-service teachers, curricula that are aligned with evidence-based practice, ongoing progress monitoring, typically using a, a state-approved assessment system, and intervention for students who are not making progress, along with uh, added requirements for teacher preparation programs and oftentimes uh, added licensure uh, assessments that students have to take to demonstrate their knowledge of the science of reading. I understand the spirit of these laws. Yes, reading should be informed by high quality research. I don't think anyone in this room would uh, disagree with that. It should be guided by ongoing assessment and we should modify instruction for students who are not making progress. All that is logical and makes sense. However, the difficulties emerge when we dig into the details and unpack the knowledge, the ideas, outcomes, and voices that are privileged within these innocuous sounding laws. So the conference theme is interrogating hierarchies, building a hum humanitarian literacy research architecture that binds. And as I noted, there's a number of hierarchies embedded within the science of reading movement. So I'm going to run through several and talk through, I think, five hierarchies that exist. So first is a literacy hierarchy. What counts as literacy? Over the last several decades, we've seen an expansion of the conceptualization of literacy to include multimodal, digital, coding, gaming, video, art, and more. Um, yet, science of reading is pr prioritizing traditional text reading, which is a vital skill. I don't think we should discount traditional text writing. But that's being valued over all other forms of literacy. And these state policies that are taking place are forcing out the recent emergence of expanded views of literacy in schools. Coding was just beginning to emerge in schools, and especially in elementary schools. And now that is being forced out because laws like the state of Virginia, where I am, say that the entire literacy block must be guided by uh, a state-approved evidence-based curriculum. So it feels like we're taking several states back, several steps back. Um, writing is already under, under emphasized in school, and it's rarely mentioned in science of reading. The, the tide is shifting on that. We're starting to see writing mentioned a little bit more frequently, but it's still certainly not getting the uh, attention it deserves. Steve Graham made a clear case that science of reading has not capitalized on the research showing the positive impact of writing on reading outcomes. So by not including writing, we're missing opportunities. And digital literacies and multimodal literacies are virtually ignored or dismissed entirely. Yet more and more, according to uh, Jennifer Rousel, more and more contemporary texts draw on a number of modes, speech, image, still or moving image, writing, music, action, more and more, the dominant side of the appearance for text is the screen, or rather, screens of all kinds. These factors are giving rise to a pronounced difference in kinds of text that are linked to generations. Yet when we look at the policies and the associated instructional practices, these literacies are not a part of what's taking place. All right, so hierarchy number two I'm going to talk about is the focus. What factors influence reading? The current science of reading movement focuses on the five pillars from you know, 25 years ago. These are essential skills for learning to read, and they do have a strong research base. I'm not saying that they are not important, that they should not be taught. They absolutely should be a part of what's taking place. However, there are numerous factors that influence learning to read that also have a strong research base that are not getting any press. They're not getting any legislation and aren't making their ways into classrooms. So what about the role of culture? What about the role of identity, economic status, access to libraries, early childhood education? All of those have a very strong research base for powerfully influencing students' reading, yet we don't hear about those. And what about the research on how people learn? 
In 2018, there's a text, How People Learn Too, an updated version of a, a landmark book, How People Learn. It's informed by multiple disciplines, from anthropology to cognitive psychology to medicine and everything in between. And that group of scholars highlight the role of background knowledge, the role of culture, language ability, motivation, interest, self-regulation. Yet science of reading is more focused on foundational skills being taught in rote, boring ways. How many folks have been in a classroom and watched a science of reading lesson? Try to stay awake, because the kids have trouble too. It is not fun. And this is blatantly flying in the face of what we know about how people learn. All right, so research, or research, hierarchy number three, we're gonna talk about the hierarchy of research. <coughs> what research counts? Perhaps a remnant of No Child Left Behind, which legally codified scientifically based research as experimental or quasi-experimental quasi research. Quantitative research is privileged over qualitative research in the science of reading. And embedded within this hierarchy are epistemological assumptions about what counts as science, including that science is the only way to create knowledge. So in this hierarchy, we lose out on nuance and explanation uh, that often emerges in qualitative data. So uh, oftentimes we're finding these statistically significant differences with large ends that tell us that something works, uh, but we don't know why, how, for whom, at what dose, for which, disp uh, which students, um, but that research isn't valued. So science of reading advocates often draw instructional decisions based upon basic research, thereby skipping a major step application in the research to practice paradigm. And science of reading scholars themselves, those who are some of the loudest advocates, acknowledge this shortcoming. They, they describe the importance of translational research to build a science of teaching reading to complement the science of reading. And here's an opportunity, I think, for those of us in this room and in, in LRA to capitalize on this acknowledgement to do research on effectively teaching a diverse range of students, which isn't necessarily uh, evident in the existing knowledge base guiding the science of reading, and then uh, merging that, that knowledge with what we know from the science of reading. So that way we're using all the research at our hands to do what's best for teachers and kids uh, instead of privileging certain perspectives. All right, the fourth hierarchy I'm gonna talk about are voice hierarchies. Whose voice counts? Who, whose ideas matter? And in the science of reading movement, certain voices are privileged above others. Particular individuals, who are associated with particular associations, curricula, research paradigm, or instructional approaches are elevated or dismissed. My wife and I are working with a state, a Midwestern state, to uh, provide professional development to support their statewide rollout of the science of reading. Uh, and we prepare slides, but then those slides for this online professional development for teachers, coaches, leaders, uh, has to be approved by the Department of Education. Very seldom do they question or push back on our content, but very often they push back on who we cite. So it's not the content they don't like, it's just who we're acknowledging. They say, change that citation from them to them. And that just blows my mind because that research says the same thing. It's not, it's not saying a different content. They just want the right people cited, um, which is very frustrating. All right, so I don't know, many of you may not know this, but I got my uh, reading specialist degree and PhD at University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and had the opportunity to take several classes with Francine Johnston who is an excellent scholar and uh, one of the co-authors of Word Study, of which word sorts are central. So I'm a fan of word sorts, so I thought we'd do a little word sort here. I'm going to put a name on the board, and you're gonna sort it in your mind. We're not gonna do any public, uh, public sorting here, but I want you to put it in category A, that voice is elevated. Or category B, this voice is discounted. All right, everyone know the task? All right, Lucy Calkins. 
Uh, Lucy Calkins. Uh, what about Emily Hanford? Elevated or dismissed? What about Richard Allington? Mm. What about Louisa Motes? Ken Goodman. Linnea Airy. Maury Clay. So you all can see everyone up on this uh, slide, uh, well, most of them up on this slide, uh, have done excellent scholarship. Uh, yet some of them uh, have a seat at the table and their research is being thrown out into schools, sold to schools in many cases, and others are being totally dismissed or in the worst case, demonized. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. All right, my final hierarchy I'm gonna talk about is language hierarchies. And I'm just scratching the surface because I know my friend Raul is gonna really unpack this for us uh, up next. But what language is value? An assumption within the science of reading movement is the supremacy of English, generally, and mainstream, white mainstream English specifically. So this assumption, right out of the gate, marginalizes multilingual learners and students who speak other dialects. Such deficit views undermine students' identities and we're also missing opportunities to capitalize on helping these students grow in a multitude of ways of all literacies. And we look back at how people learn, acknowledging the language they bring with them, their background knowledge and previous experiences, all that is central to growing and getting smarter, uh, yet we are denying uh, huge swaths of children the opportunity to capitalize on them. And let's remember, oftentimes the science of reading is presented as the remedy for closing the achievement gaps, to, to fix the underperformance of students of color. But forcing them uh, and denying their own language uh, is not the path to do it. Instead, we really need to start thinking about uh, what performance actually is. So I have two quotes here. One is a, a little depressing and one is uplifting. So we'll start. Uh, with the quote, for too long, scholarship on access and equity has centered implicitly or explicitly around the question of how to get working class students of color to speak or write more like middle class white ones. Yet on a more hopeful note, I love this quote and I wanted to make sure it got in here. How you language is beautiful. Don't let anyone tell you your languaging is wrong. Your languaging is the story of your life. So what is lost in these hierarchies? We're losing equity, we're losing opportunities for uh, digital and multimodal learning, motivated engaged learning is not being emphasized, we're losing a love of reading, we're losing culturally responsive and culturally sustaining pedagogies, we're losing positive identity development and we're losing humanizing instruction. So how can we dismantle these hierarchies? My my closing thought here is I think that we need research and advocacy. LRA folks are excellent researchers, but we tend to be advocates. So I think we need to take the advocacy part more seriously. And I'm putting myself in this category. I am definitely pretty meh when it comes to um, the, the advocacy piece. So we need to continue to study, discuss, and advocate teaching literacies broadly defined to support symbiotic growth among all the literacies. A multitude, we need to study and advocate for a multitude of factors that influence reading. We need to advocate for diverse methodologies and epistemologies. We need to advocate for respectful dialogue, debate, and disagreement instead of canceling people or outright dismissing ideas and uh, giving the mic just to a select few. And we need to expand the languages, we need to advocate for expanding the languages and dialects that are valued in schools. So I encourage LRA members to be, to be publicly engaged scholars who advocate for approaches to teaching literacy that are genuinely informed by a comprehensive research base by working closely with schools, school systems, state education departments, school boards, and by also engaging with the public through social media, if we've learned anything through the science of reading movement is that a, a robust media um, 
stance can really change public opinion and ultimately change uh, policy. And we need to speak back to what's taking place. And social media is a prime outlet. That's where a lot of these conversations are taking place. Um, and we also need to uh, take opportunities to write op-eds so we can have our nuanced, informed dis uh, ideas and research uh, involved in these policy-making decisions. So thank you. Wow, we're off to a really good start on this panel. Thank you, Latrice. Thank you, Seth, for getting us started. And um, now is my, my, my turn to bat. And I'm happy to um, share my thoughts with you this morning um, on this idea I'm conceptualizing as the hierarchies of English in literacy research. Um, oh, yeah. So first of all, a quick thank you to the multilingual transnational and international ICGs. Um, sorry, just one second. I forgot to do one little thing. This for the purposes of writing the paper later. So um, quick thank you to those ICGs for endorsing my participation here. Quick thank you to Dr. Tatum and Dr. Boyd for making it possible for me to cross out this from my academic bucket list, the opportunity to be in this panel, and to all the other scholars at Arena, the places who inspired my work through writing and conversations. And I would be remiss not to thank a special group that includes my partner, Polina, the Legion, the LSLP Legion, Connor and Duncan, my dogs, <laughs> and the Sneaky Penguin, who is accompanying me and the crazies today. Um, I'm going to develop this in five points. First, a little bit where I come from, then why we have to have this conversation, then frame what we mean by hierarchies of English, then some principles of how we transgress, disrupt, and dismantle that, and then a final reflection on the call for what lies ahead. So where do I come to in this conversation? Um, it's a journey that it's basically 40 years as a language learner and 30 years as a teacher, where I have gone from, compli from compliance to defiance in the sense of um, I stopped being the person who enforces the hierarchies to someone who wants to defy them and, dis and basically dismantle them. I have moved in my way of seeing myself as a language speaker to a language user to a language co-creator. I use my pronouns as a way, as, a, as the reclamation of my language rights, in the sense that I'm not claiming that I am equally fluent in, in Spanish and English and Norwegian and Portuguese and French and Polish. I'm just saying those these languages are part of my life and I cl claim the right to claim them as mine. And of course, some of my documented adventures learning Norwegian, as some of my friends in fa on Facebook know, I document the weird phrases I get on Duolingo, like this one. Store bro said I, big brother is watching you, and I'm like, what the hell, Duolingo? <laughs> so that's where I come from here. And now the question is why we need to have this conversation. And here's an interesting fact for all of you. Right now, if you look at the board of directors, six out of nine of the people who represent you the board are someone we would qualify as second language English speakers. And two out of those nine members, Dr. Zaidi and myself, we reside outside of the United States. So this is a good time to get in this conversation, to get into debates, because there are questions about literacy that are happening in other languages. And we need to really know what's going on and stop assuming, like Cress may have done at some point back in the day, that what folks are doing is simply translating the word literacy into other languages. We'll get to that later. Now, you notice I put the word English in brackets, and that's a caveat. We are having this conversation today in English and about English because of where we are. We're at LRA, we're in Atlanta, Georgia. The, the, the main language of the conference is in English. But I don't think other majority language should be left off the hook. Other languages deal with the same hierarchies, deal with the same circles of complicity, deal with the same circles of colonialism, and at some point, I'm coming for you. And this paper, <laughs> thank you, it's basically sharing with you where I am in this journey, where my research, your research, their research comes together, and think of this as a paper, as a manifesto, as a roadmap, as a compass for the battles lying ahead, where I invite you all to be part of. So let's quickly frame the hierarchies of English, and I want to use um, this little graph where we have two particular issues with the hierarchies. On the one hand, there is this 
notion of monolingualism where we should only communicate in English. So we leave other language out of the equation. But at the same time, there is this monoglossic understanding where we should exclusively communicate in specific dialects or registers, leaving out other variants, including from other countries, from other regions within those English-speaking countries out of the conversation. Um, and I share this quote from a forthcoming paper I, I'm writing with my friend, mentee, and colleague, Tatiana Chiquito Gomez, where I say, we come to discussion with a real concern we have witnessed. The reality that particular regional or national varieties of English give one better odds of getting accepted into publications and academic outlets. And we notice that anything that does not conform to the norm gets rejected simply because it doesn't fit those standards. And this normativity needs to be contested. This is especially true when we think about how these biases affect not only people who write in English as the second language, but also people whose use of English as their first language does not match those quote unquote expectations. Conceptually, uh, when I foreground these hierarchies of English in research, um, there are three moments. First, some foundational research. So we're talking about research over the years, like the fund, um, work of um, Robert Phillips on Entuvas, Kudnap Kangas on imperialism, the work of Rio Kukubota on linguistic racism, Pierre Bourdieu's work on language and power, Alastair Pernicook's ideas of uh, critical applied linguistics, Alan Luke's discussions of English, Hilary Jank's discussions of literacy in power, and Joseph Rubianco's discussions on multilingualism and multiliteracies. And along that, there is a host of emerging research that is having these conversations, like the work on racial linguistic ideologies by Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa, um, the work of Nelson Flores on language architecture, the work of Sender Dobchen on language racism, and the work of Vijay Ramjadan on the same topic and issues of accent, uh, the work of our very own Patreon Smith on immigrant literacies, uh, the work of April Baker Bell on linguistic justice, the work of Lamar Johnson on critical race English education, the work of my Colombian colleague, Jesse Ortega, on this notion of destroy and veros as these geopolitical and economic forces affecting languages, and the work of our good friend, Chris Cheng Bacon, and the notion of the idealized speaker. Now, it's important to mention this is an incomplete list. I'm still looking for that, I'm still con and I'm still engaging in fellowship with this research. And on top of that, um, next to that, is the research I have developed related to Englishes over the years, uh, over the past 20 years, and how that foregrounds these conversations and how the, it helps propel these conversations moving forward. So the invitation right now is to look at some challenges and principles as we embark on the transgressing, disrupting, and dismantling the hierarchies of English. So here's another thought from that chapter I mentioned. So it is important here to, th to see that there are two divergent yet overlapping views. On the one hand, Yes, we must support writing in multiple languages, being mindful that if English is the only language we are writing and creating knowledge in, we may potentially discriminate against those who do not use it. This happens specifically with people who write rhetoric in English, not as their first language, but are the second. We support writing in multiple languages. But at the same time, we must also remain cautious not to chastise those who may choose to write in a second language and not equating that to selling out to the colonizers. We must combat misrepresentations that South means refusing other languages, which may end up playing into the monoglossic views akin to colonial views. We invite our readers not to play into those discourses. Whatever language you choose are yours. And that kind of resonates with some of the things that Latrice was saying in her presentation. So what does it mean to transgress, disrupt, and dismantle the hierarchies of English? First of all, it means that we have to recognize that the existing frameworks and conceptualizations are disenfranchising a lot of people and that inaction is no longer an option. It also means understanding that English still plays a role as a broker, but it has to be from a stronger ecological stance that stops imposing limited choices about what English should look or sound for most of us. It also means we have to use the lessons we have developed in the, our conceptualization and understanding of the literacies in, the, in, that plural, in that pluralization of literacy to inform and support and coalesce efforts in other fields like social linguistics or linguistics around the idea of Englishes. The field of literacy research has a lot to tell 
people in world Englishes and English as a lingua franca on how to conceptualize those notions from stronger social justice frameworks. It also me uh, means it is an invitation to take a true global stance regarding the literacy debates, that you recognize what's going on in Latin America, where there is a strong contingent of scholars who are doing a lot of work around the notions of literacidad in Spanish and letramento in Portuguese, that we have to look more carefully at Africa besides just looking at South Africa, that we need to look at what's going on in Europe besides what's happening in the UK, that we need to look at Asia, and we need to look at what's going on in Oceania besides looking at Australia. There are debates in these places, and I've been able to, trace, to um, track down debates happening in Poland, debates happening in Norway, debates happening in Scandinavia, about the ways in which we are either turning literacy into polysemic word, a polysemic word, as it is in English, or we are creating and rewriting the concept, as we did in Latin America with Literacidad and Letramento, as we reinvented the concept to better encompass the social, political, and, uh, and socioeconomic realities of our social contexts. Um, it also means we have to be a little more global and more conscious about the conceptual and methodological choices. We need to start interrogating whose works we're citing and from what regions of the world, and from what traditions and what sources of knowledge. Are we looking at ancestral knowledges in, in terms of literacy? And are we looking at what's going on in other languages? What efforts are we making collectively to find out what scholars who are not writing in English or who are writing in different varieties of English are doing and how that is going to inform your scholarship moving forward. And it in understanding that if we're thinking of literacy as a global affair, we also need to revisit the demands we're asking from minoritized English scholars and from non-Anglo scholars that more often than not, Main Street Anglo scholars don't even know exist or are subjected to. And it is, in this sense, it also means we have to stop thinking, and I want to take a moment to really um, credit Polina, Dr. Polina Golovati Namora, for this particular section, because she's the one who's really helped me conceptualize this part. In this motion, motion that we have to move away from simply being gatekeepers to becoming gate openers and bridge builders that we have to stop disrupting the cycles of monolingualism and subtracting bilingualism literacy research. That means those of us um, dealing with journals, conferences, and other academic spaces need to take a long look in the mirror and start thinking how we move forward. So I just to end, a um, little bit of a call, how are we gonna do this? And I like to always begin with the idea of, it all begins with a tweak. So I offer you two provocations, one from Myself, Dr. Berry, and this is something I tell my students. Look, every 180 degree turn inevitably becomes a 360 degree turn. So I'm not saying this has to be something complete, I mean a sharp turn to the left because we're gonna, we're gonna end up at the same point. And I also offer you a quote from an essay, from a very famous essay from a postmodern philosopher from Gary, Indiana, uh, Jackson. Uh, and Jackson says, I quote, I'm starting with the one in the mirror. I'm, starting, I'm asking them to change their ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. So yeah, Jackson from Gary, Indiana, bring it, bring it, I mean, dropping the wisdom of LRA, ladies and gentlemen. And as we get ready to go home, I'm going to leave you with this particular thought. I want you to think about the principles and the challenges I outlined in this, in this short presentation as the beginning of an extended conversation that we wish to have as we also work on the, the upcoming paper that will come out of this panel. And think about the commitments you are ready to make as scholars, as advocates, as mentors, as a collective, as a comunidad, next week when you're back in your institutions, next year once you're back from the holidays. And in that time frame between today, as we say goodbye to LRA 2023, and the next, in the, and, that, and, that, or, and that Wednesday after Thanksgiving, when we're gonna come back together as a collective in LRA 
in the LRA Conference 2024. Think about the challenges, you, the little tweaks you can make to your research, to your scholarship, to your mentorship that can help, that can help us collectively dismantle these hierarchies of English so we can have a field of literacy research that really lives up to principles of linguistic equity, linguistic diversity, and linguistic justice. On that note, thank you very much. And of course, I'll be remiss to say, you, cannot, you can never go wrong with puppies on the final slide. That was Connor and Duncan. Thank you. Antero, bring us home. That was wonderful. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this, the, the paper I'm going to present is co-authored with Dr. Nicole Mira, who's, who's over there. So all of the good stuff, please uh, credit her. When, when I screw things up, if there's typos, that's definitely my fault. Um, the, the idea for, for this work comes from a paper that's coming out in the Review of Research and Education uh, soon. This, it, I think it's a 2023 publication, so imminently. Um, but the, I want to start this conversation today with you all um, with uh, an article that I sent to Nicole while I was flying home from NCTE two weeks ago. Um, and I, I got really grumpy as we were talking back and forth. And at one point, she wrote back and said, are you on a plane? Because she could just tell like, I had nothing else to do but to, to bug her um, as we we're talking. Uh, and so uh, on November 18th, the New York Times published uh, their, their long editorial board opinion, the startling evidence on, the learning, on learning loss is in. I'll just read two of the opening paragraphs. The evidence is now in, and it's startling. The school closures that took 50 million children out of classrooms at the start of the pandemic may prove to be the most damaging disruption in the history of American education. It also set student progress in math and reading back by two decades and widened the achievement gap that separates poor and wealthy children. Those learning losses will remain unaddressed when the federal money runs out in 2024, this uh, pandemic relief money. Economists are predicting that this generation with such a significant education gap will experience diminished lifetime earnings and become a significant drag on the economy, but education administrators and elected officials who should be mobilizing the country against this threat are not. Uh, it goes on and on. It talks to people who I don't usually agree with, uh, and I continue to not agree with them uh, in, in this piece. Uh, and, and I want us to kind of reframe what do we think of as learning loss? What are the privileges to think of, of a word that's been invoked in a couple of the other papers? What counts as learning loss? This is a word that historically, before the pandemic, was used to talk about the differences of, of what learning looked like across summer periods uh, in between academic school years, and we've now leveraged it for this broader conversation. Uh, who counts as, get, as losing what kinds of learning? I think to the same kinds of reflections on what kinds of uh, scholarship are counted for reading, uh, what kinds of languages are included in this conversation. Uh, and ultimately, the solution uh, that comes across, as, as Nicole uh, reminded me as we're talking through this, uh, the solution that is pointed to through all of, all of this is just to do more, right? All of this stuff that's broken, the way we're going to fix this, the way we're going to close this gap is to just do more of the broken forms of schooling that we've historically done. And that is a damning reflection, I think, of what our field has done, right? If all we can do is to say, increase this, do this a little bit more effectively, we're going to close this gap, that's, that's kind of perpetuating the hamster wheel of a lack of progress uh, that continues to create the larger gap that we've been seeing for a long time. It also points to the kind of historical challenges we've seen, right? These reflections look like the same kinds of warning calls from a nation at risk. It looks like what we've talked about a century ago uh, when we talk about something like progressive education. And so I just want to remind us that as we think of this, right, there is a way to think of there are many other universes that regularly exist, right? There is a world of many worlds that are always around us. Hollywood has prepared us for this moment to recognize that there are multiversal approaches to thinking about the realities around us. Rather than for taking for granted the deficit orientations of what's around us, let's recognize the kinds of power and ingenuity of young people, of educators, of researchers, and think of new kinds of approaches that might emerge around us. Nicole and I have been trying to think about this through an idea of the speculative and thinking about beyond the horizon. Uh, and so I want to think of a couple of framing questions um, to guide this orientation for the next couple of minutes. Uh, this comes from the end of the paper because I just want to make sure I read these questions so I don't get them uh, incorrect. What kinds of measurable outcomes are most urgent for communities currently experiencing structural oppression? And how do those map onto our scholarly research agendas? How are shared orientations toward equity extrapolated out to larger and more ideologically diverse communities? And how can new systems be seeded within the oppressiveness and flexibility to avoid the rigidity that stifles mutuality and shifting goals? And so I want to kind of think about 
all of this stuff, and let's return to the present and kind of think of three kind of dominant paradigms that have emerged as solutions uh, throughout and, and as we move beyond the pandemic in this moment. Uh, so three pieces that Nicole and I have kind of covered are SEL, social emotional learning, uh, the framework of what do we count as digital citizenship, and this idea of 21st century learning. I just want to kind of put that in quotes, 21st century learning, partnership for 21st century learning is a kind of useful framework to think of all of this. So social emotional learning, we're probably familiar with this as an idea. I want to think of what the kind of dominant discourse is, what the research generally frames this around. It tends to be a focus on individual models of regulation and control. It tends to be about measurable kinds of approaches. Uh, I think to Seth, it is the kind of like whose work is, is uh, cited when we talk about SEL. I guess there'll, there'll be kind of a recurring motif for all of these. Um, but it really gets driven down to generalizable approaches of, of management, right? That it's not about uh, it's not about expanding my emotions. It's about managing my emotions, right? It's about regulating my emotions, right? And regulating towards particular kinds of norms and, and motifs, right? That ultimately, when we think about healing and SEL, the healing stuff comes secondary. The primary aspect of how SEL work tends to be framed is around: Can I control myself so that I am manageable for all of you, for you to tolerate who I am? Digital citizenship. Uh, there. Uh, we, I've been very grumpy around digital citizenship for a long time, so I'll just point to you briefly. There's kind of three domains that we've thought about of what digital citizenship looks like. We primarily focus on safety and civility, right? We make sure that kids don't get bullied online, and that means we're being good citizens. We tend to focus on disinformation. Uh, we're really worried about that. When we have this conversation next year in this room, uh, there will be a new president elected, uh, supposedly. Um, and, so, and so we think of like, what does disinformation look like around all of these pieces? As we think about global conflicts right now, what are the ways we can trust the images and the language and the quotes that are showing up on our screen? This is a very important piece, um, but information itself will not move us beyond a democratic crisis. Uh, what will, and the piece that oftentimes is diminished is this other final circle here, right? This idea of what is civic engagement, what does youth voice, what are the ways we might move towards a form of civic innovation look like for young people? How can they transform their practices both in online and offline spaces? You can see there's this kind of spectrum of kinds of political engagement with this work, the kinds of methodological approaches, but oftentimes when I, when I say the word digital citizenship, it usually evokes for folks these, these first two circles, safety and civility uh, and information analyses. And lastly, for 21st century learning, uh, in, in a paper for Reading Research Quarterly a couple years ago, uh, Nicole and I looked through uh, empirical classroom-based research that used the framework of 21st century learning to kind of think of what kinds of practices show up in these spaces. What do, uh, what do we as literacy teachers, what do we, we as an educational research community count as 21st century learning. Uh, it is primarily technology, right? It is, uh, it's 21st century learning if you can plug it in and charge it and it does something for kids. Um, but when you get down to it, 21st century learning looks a whole lot like 20th and 19th century learning. It's about active learning. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is striking that if you were to update the, the language uh, of Dewey's framework of progressive education from over a century ago, it would look like 21st century learning. So uh, we're, we're either very behind the curve or he was very ahead of the curve, uh, or we've just kind of forgotten, right? This is the, I think, Raul, this is the, we've gone 360 degrees. Uh, great job, us. Um, and so one pathway that we've been trying to think through as a pathway forward, and, and, it's, and I say this as a pathway, a, a methodological pathway, is the idea of a social design-based experiment, an SDBE. You've got to come up with like a better way to say it. It takes take a long time, but SDBEs. Um, this work comes from the work of Dr. Gutierrez, uh, Chris Gutierrez, um, and she, she writes uh, that social design-based experiments demand radical shifts in our view of learning and our perceptions of youth from non-dominant communities so that they can become agents of newly imagined futures. These social design-based experiments largely look like the kinds of critical participatory forms of scholarship, but there's a couple of key changes that I want to highlight of what, what we mean for those of us who engage in this work. Right? It, focus on, it focuses on historicity. We don't do this in a bubble. We recognize the kinds of given cultural context and conditions uh, that have driven us to this present moment. What are the pasts that we invoke in doing this research in the present? It's also about thinking about the system-based forms of remediation, right? So if we're working within schooling context, we think about the schooling system. We think about the social systems that might have changed and shaped what young people are experiencing. We're also recognizing that the cultural context that young people are engaging in, or the cultural context that we're doing this work alongside others, uh, is constantly changing, right? That what we might think of as a cultural context of doing this work in a particular school community five years ago is not the context now. The context during the pandemic is not the context now, right? This is constantly shifting, and if you move from one classroom to another, if you move from one space to another, it's also constantly changing. 
But across all of these, the thing that is most important is a persistent focus on equity, right? Recognizing that there are inequities to address and doing those alongside other individuals and doing this through these kinds of contexts. It's remeeting towards a form of equity. We tried to do a meta-analysis, a meta-synthesis of this. So we looked at, um, since the kind of idea of social design-based experiments has emerged from uh, Chris in, in 2010 uh, to when we we're finishing this analysis in January of this year, uh, we found 17 different studies that have kind of used this as a, as a methodological framework for what this work looks like. And we read and coded across these studies as they've been published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, kind of thought about the kinds of disciplinary knowledge, the kinds of geographical setting. I'm not gonna review this table. It's really great. Read, read the paper when it comes out, but just for sake of time. Um, but I want to get to this idea of these tangled roots. I can't believe they let us put this figure uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in, this, in this paper. Um, so I wanted to share it with you all because it's, it's very ugly. I made it. Nicole didn't make it. Uh, and so I want to recognize these kinds of like key ideas of oftentimes when we think of these tangled roots, right, this idea of um, all of these pieces, all of these system, systemic contexts of how we do this work are deeply intertwined. We can't, take, we can't take on one without taking on the other, right? And so if we think about these tangled roots, right, we need to think about what is the tangled root of the problem? What problem counts as the work that we're doing? What are the expansive horizons? What counts as impact, right? How do we redefine the outcomes of our research uh, beyond just getting another line on our CV, right? And what does resilient collaboration look like? What's it mean to do collaboration with communities? What does uh, a, a quote unquote equal distribution of labor look like versus a quote unquote equitable distribution of labor look like? And so there's an endemic problem that I've been frustrated mainly about with myself, so I'm gonna use this as a moment of self-therapy, uh, and that is that a lot of the papers that I tend to write or that I see many of my uh, colleagues and other critical scholars write, we tend to end or we tend to title them with these words like beyond a something something or toward or imagining or calling for. Uh, and, and I think we can do better than that. I think we need to stop kind of calling for something else. I think we need to recognize that rather than trying to push towards what's happening in the future or, to, or uh, invoking something that might come beyond, right, that we are always in the present, right? We do not need to call for something else because it is here, right? And what I want to call for is this idea of a, uh, a, met a multiversal speculation, right? What would it mean for us to imagine the world right now as a place where these kinds of possibilities exist right now rather than trying to think of what's going to happen in the future? Thank you. So I know that you will agree with me that this was quite a provocative a uh, series of conversations. Put your hands together again for our wonderful panelists. And at this time, we want to open up for questions, for comments, and just to, to share your thoughts with us about the wonderful talks that you've heard and how you're thinking and feeling about some of these ideas and how you're probably going to use some of those in your practice. We do have that wait time feature that we can build in. <laughs> Who wants to get us started? All right, I see we have a gracious hand in the back. Do you mind coming up? Do we have a microphone that you can use? He's good. Okay. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm currently assistant professor at Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin State University. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in Texas. It's a SOR, science reading state. And my question is about science reading. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot of teacher friends who are amazingly wonderful teachers with a, usually more than 20 years of a teaching experiences. And they came to me and cry a lot every day. <laughs> So I really want to help them, but I couldn't help them be because it's the policy and another important part is money issues. So I can tell you one story. 
Uh, she's one of the best uh, teachers I've ever met in my lifetime, second grade teacher, and 28 years of teaching experiences. And she told me all the time, almost we talk every week, uh, she cannot do science reading, she cannot teach using science reading, but her superintendent, principal, came to her, get rid of all what you know, get rid of all you know, all you know right now. Start with the science reading, science reading only. She has uh, reading, she worked as a reading specialist for 20 years, teacher masters, reading masters, and, and she asked why. And the school said, we got $8 million. The small school district got $8 million in the, under the condition that they implement the science reading program in their school. It's a real story, yes. So, uh, as a teacher educator, and in my class, I have a, a lot of pre-survey teachers and in-survey teachers. Master's program, all of them are in-survey teachers. So how can I, as a teacher educator, I know that and I cannot agree with that either, SOR, <laughs> so, but my pre series teacher should take exam. If they cannot pass the exam, they cannot get certified. They cannot get a certification. And in service teachers, a lot of stress. Mm. So could you give me some ideas? How can I guide them? Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, I'm thinking that we're going to pass this over to Dr. Parsons. I don't know if this, is this mic working? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it, thank you for telling that story. It, it's one that, um, unfortunately, I don't think is unique. And it's really soul crushing as an educator to hear about exemplary educators being, uh, ha having their hands tied and not being able to do their craft in the way that they know what's best. As far as how to navigate in this space, I would love to hear from others as well. Because once the legal situation, once the laws are involved, it's a big ask. I mean, even a 28-year veteran, much less the teachers that we're sending out into the, the classroom, before, um, before the, the laws were enacted, I used to really promote my students, the teachers, uh, to always do what's best for kids. Uh, keep, if we keep the students at the center of what you're doing, you won't go wrong. That was my, my wisdom to my, my future teachers. But they don't necessarily have the freedom to do that now. And I, I too, am at a loss. I'm not, you know, we can't tell them to toe the line, but we can't tell them to break the law. Mm -hmm. And part two of your story about the, the money is especially disheartening because, you know, they always say follow the money. And I know some, some folks have done some analyses to do just that and follow the money. And it's not a, it's, a, it's kind of a scary, hmm. scary situation uh, that lots of people, well, not lots of people, a, Few people are making a lot of money off of this uh, science of reading initiative. Uh, and to give out funds to require certain types of instruction, we've been down this road before. You know, reading first required certain curricula to get federal funding, and it sounds like they're doing it with private funds now. But I don't, I don't have any answers uh, because I would love to open it up and hear from the wisdom in this room. When we're in a situation like this and there are laws enacted that prevent teachers from doing what they know is best for kids, how do we, as their teachers, as their guides, uh, operate within that space? And I see someone has the mic. I do. Um, so I'm Dr. Thrillkill. I'm from East Carolina University. I have been <clears throat> enmeshed in the science of reading and in particular letters for quite some time now. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, North Carolina has passed legislation, it's been enacted, it has been a long, and I won't give all of the details, but it's been very difficult. So some direct advice to, to the issue. What we did 
is that we, as, uh, in our College of Education, the literacy educators, the elementary educators, and the special <coughs> educators who focus on reading, we got together and we mapped every objective in our courses, and we looked at the exam in the North Carolina, that's the Foundations of Reading Test. We looked at the example exams that we had available to us because they have just redone the exam to focus on the science of reading. And we did a full programmatic look at what are we teaching that aligns to this new version of the test, what have we previously taught them that now does not align so that we can try and give them that information. And we found that a lot of it was, could be addressed through vocabulary support and helping them to understand that a lot of what's being done is just renaming practices that we've taught them. But to help them explicitly make the connections that these words mean these concepts and you do know it. And the other thing we've done is, just to that one question, is that we have started adding into our courses vocabulary journaling directly tied to their exam so that then they can bring that and we can update it as they keep changing the test because I think this is our third change to that test in just a few years. So that's one suggestion is, is collaborating <laughs> a lot. So I'm asking for the panel and everybody here to help me with a critique that I'm um, thinking about and already have started to write about. So I'm just trying to confirm before it goes to print, am I crazy or am I getting it right, basically? So why not use all these scholars and experts in the room before it goes to print? So my critique of it is, in a, in a core sense, that I don't see that there is a theory of the reader in science of reading is how I'm thinking about it. I don't know who you theorize as the reader, and I don't hear you theorizing uh, in any critical way what that means to be a reader. Who do you mean when you say reader? And is that a critical understanding of what it means to be a reader in the science of reading? I'm just asking very simply, am I off track? Have you all saw, seen stuff that does theorize what, who the reader is and who readers are supposed to be? in that world, or I'm just trying to hear from everyone and make the most of this moment. <laughs> um, I think you're absolutely right on track, and that uh, the, the individual really gets lost in this because we are looking at uh, big studies with big ends and quantitative uh, experimental designs. Uh, are driving most of the decisions therein. Uh, so uh, when you were saying that, I immediately went to the old RAND model that had the reader, the text, the task. Um, and I, I, uh, you don't hear much about uh, that outer ring, the sociocultural context in which reading takes place, or the individual reader. So I, I, my, my response is I think you, you really got something here, uh, but I would, I would love to hear from others on this panel as well. I'm not a science of reading scholar, but I, I appreciate the framing of the reader as a way to kind of think through the lack of humanization in what and how we're the discourse around the science of reading. I'm thinking about Raul, your use of brackets around literacy, around Englishes, mm -hmm. and thinking about you know we should probably put some brackets around science. We should probably put some brackets around reading as as we think about this piece. Uh, one of my kids' favorite books right now is uh, "There's a Monster at the End of This Book." Um, I'm going to spoil it for all of you in case you haven't read it. Uh, it, it features Grover, uh, and Grover gets very stressed out because he knows that there's a monster at the end of the book, and as it gets closer and closer, it's goddamn Grover at the end. He is the monster <laughs> at the end of the book. Uh, and, and I think I want to recognize, right, as we worry and worry about the ghosts of, of the damage of the science of reading, as we keep worrying and worrying and, and perpetuating the discourse around it, right, we are causing that damage by, by reinforcing and kind yes. of spinning ourselves in circles around this, right? We can be the monster at the end of our own book, or we could do something transformative and accept the kinds of monstrous possibilities of what we are doing. Hi. Um, is it working? Yeah. I just wanted to, um, is it working at all? Yeah, it is now. Um, I just wanted to 
point out something I brought in my presentation, and it's this issue of the, coal of the coalescence and the need of coalitions. The people behind the science of reading movement are very likely incredibly well organized. I'm not gonna go beyond, I'm gonna talk about the funding thing, I'm gonna talk about the organization. These are groups of people who are very well organized and are really, or really coalescing around that common cause. One of the things we have to start thinking, I'm, now I'm speaking in terms of professional associations as one, just one point of illustration is, we have to start coming together as coalitions to counter those discourses. Because I know that NCTE, and now that we have the pre uh, NCTE president here, uh, is doing stuff, and we know LRA is doing stuff, and we know ARA does stuff, and we know ILA does stuff, and I imagine TESOL does stuff, so that's AAAL. The question is, when are all these people gonna sit at the table and start, you know, thinking that we're gonna have to be like the Avengers and assemble because the, no, because the others are already assembled. Thanos already brought his armies. When are we gonna assemble, when are we gonna call, get, get the Avengers to, to counter them? This is one, that's one of those levels where we have, to, if we have to take the fight. It's how we come together because all these organizations I mentioned, they have one thing in common. They all, have, they all talk about reading. They all have to do, deal with reading comprehension on different levels. When are we gonna really come together and assemble the Avengers for the fight ahead? So I just wanted to um, bring that point of reflection in the importance of coalitions. And, and, and I agree, and I, I know one thing that I've struggled with in thinking about how to push back against these, these dangerous, um, limited approaches to teaching reading. Uh, the problem is the science of reading has boiled it down into a very simple, easy solution to a complex problem. And then the, the academics, those, those of us say, whoa, not so fast, it's incredibly complex and everyone's different and there's no simple answer and it's, it's gonna take time and change takes a long time and we have gotta get in there and it's gonna be different in every space. That isn't what people wanna hear. We don't have a good message because they want a quick, easy fix. So it's hard to have these conversations because if they're, they're faced with, well, you know, it's a multifaceted, nuanced phenomenon. And then the other side says, no, it's really quite simple. Here's the, here's the training and here's the program. And if you do that, it's informed by the science of reading. Why would you ignore us and listen to Mr. Complexity over here? Um, so it, it's a hard battle to win because they've they've oversimplified it, and that's my main con you know my main gripe about everything is they they um, and I'm using they broadly. It, it's not a huge. I mean, it's a certain it's a it's a small uh, network of folks that have really gotten the microphone, and it's through this coordinated, well coordinated, well funded effort. Um, with viral podcasts that now have people sitting around the kitchen table talking about the simple fix to this incredibly complex problem. So it, what we need to think through is how can we make our message simple, easy, and digestible to the policymakers, mm -hmm. to the administrators, uh, at the state level all the way up to the federal level because um, saying it's complex, it takes time, it takes money, um, and, and it's multifaceted and individualized and we did differentiate, that's a mouthful they don't have time for and it sounds expensive and like it's not gonna work.
And, and publish in multiple venues that reaches multiple audiences. Because if we're talking to each other, uh, we're not we're not moving the needle at all. Because we're we're on the same page generally. Um, but we we need to get away not get away from. In addition to our academic journals that we're publishing in, we need the op eds. We got to get into the newspapers. We've got to get into podcasts. We got to be on social media because that's where um, movements like Raul's uh, talking about uh, can really take place and catch fire. So absolutely, and think broadly about how to get those counter stories and narratives out. So to circle back to Marcus's question, who are we fixing? And so if you look at it historically, the people who, quote, need to be fixed are those students who are not white, who are not English dominant, who are not wealthy. And until we can tell the truth about that story, we're going to continue to have a quick fix for something that doesn't need to be fixed, that do, children who are not broken. Yeah. People who are not broken, literacies that have existed for centuries before the US was even founded. We have to tell that story. I 100% agree with that and just, and I know that letters is not everything that is SOR, but it is very indicative of what the belief structure are. So when you dig into those materials, you see that they are teaching teachers that children have word poverty, which is the framing that they use. They will also teach the teachers that English is the language of literature and culture. That is a direct quote from their materials. When you are asking, who are they conceiving of as the reader? They are conceiving of a white, middle-class, cisgender child. And that is the only reader they care about. So I think it's important for teacher educators to provide peace service teachers and service teachers with a range of ways and knowledge so that they can be more informed about how they're choosing because we can say, you know, science and reading is a thing, but teachers are also choosing to teach the science and reading. Um, and it's usually because they haven't necessarily been prepared in other ways to do it any other way. Um, when I was teaching reading to eighth grade, you know, in middle school, to in a inner city Atlanta, um, it was a very deficit model for, you know, thinking about a these black students, they don't read well. But as a teacher who was also an intellectual, who know that this is not true, that there, you know, word poverty, what even is that? Um, because black students have more words, you know, but maybe they're not mainstream words, so that's, you know, kind of where I'm going with that. But we have to prepare our pre-service teachers to think in these very ways and be able to and also speak back to administration, to policy, to say that I am a professional, I know the language, I study these things, um, and yes, I don't want to lose my job, so I teach science and reading, but I'm going to do more. I'm going to do more in addition to, um, you know, what I have to. Um, I, I felt compelled to say something after Raul called out the Avengers, and I'm rocking one of his scarves today. So, um, I'm Kevin Leander. I, um, I appreciate what you're saying, Seth, about um, media, because, well, a couple things. One is I don't think we're on the same page, so there's that. There's a lot of discourses here around reading and approaches, but the the media piece i feel like often we we abide by some sort of really outdated mode of of trickle down theories of research published that somehow eventually makes its way to practice into a public and if you look at like the creation of a person like emily hanford who if you look at a lot of uh headlines she gets she gets announced as a reading expert and, uh, and in fact, in 2017, AERA gave her uh, an award for uh, education journalism. And she's one of the voices, you know, a really significant voice, who is not a reading expert, who is not a literacy expert, who's a journalist. 
And so the idea that there's a creation of a voice in a media sphere that's happening in that way and that circulates in that way, I think at least signals for us that Emily is not the enemy, but that we don't really have a clear way forward in terms of what our voices, how our voices circulate. Maybe the way that we're looking at how they circulate is out of date by 30, 40 years. And we're hoping for some kind of change by, you know, maybe if professors write more op-eds, something will happen. And I don't, I don't want to critique that notion like as don't do that, but it seems like the actual functioning of what's happening media-wise, even by virtue of logic, I mean, a lot of what's happening media-wise is just by virtue of repetition and amplification. So what does that mean actually in terms of our particip participation in that media sphere? So in response to the word poverty piece, I just want to, you know, really lift up a very clear counter to that logic because in, in terms of black children in particular and black communities more broadly, you're hard pressed as I see history to find a community that's added more to the lexicon, lexicon of America, the lexicon of human history than black people around the world. So. I just want to make that very clear counter to that logic. You can go as far as you want to go back historically to make the point. You can talk about it on a smaller scale. You can talk about it from Ave. But I just want to make it very clear that you're not going to find a racial group or a racialized group that's added more to the lexicon of America or the world broadly in general terms or in specific terms than black folks. So I just wanted to add that to, to add to the critique of what's already being raised. So as much as we are all enjoying this conversation, we unfortunately do need to wrap it up. I have just here a few comments uh, arising from the discussion that I want to leave us with this afternoon. The first that I heard from our conversation was about balancing economic considerations that fuel the science of reading along with the legislative imperatives that come with it we're thinking about how are we humanizing teachers, how are we humanizing students, what does it look like for that subversive work to go on in and beyond classrooms. I heard also avoiding a forecasting into the future and thinking about right now, what are we doing in this moment with multiple realities available to us to change the trajectory of students and how they are approached in and beyond classrooms. <clears throat> Number three, I heard about just the idea of thinking with knowledges that are international, knowledges that extend beyond the knowledges we have in the US that may allow us to address some of these hierarchies and considerations that we wrestle with. What does it look like to engage those international knowledges? Number four, we heard a little bit about creating coordinated approaches to thinking about communicating all of the ideas that we have from literacy research. What does it look like to develop that counter narrative and communicate it in ways that all the, the people who are out there can hear it, can see it in social media? How does LRA get to do that? What does it look like to disrupt some of the ways that we have you know, traditionally communicated our information and to ramp up that effort so that we can uh, change the, the, the futures of children? And then the final one, preparing teachers in ways that allow them to have that subversive and that intellectual response to how they see students in classrooms. I want to thank our panelists again for being here. Give, let's give them a round of applause. And I also want to thank you all for being here on this final day of the conference. Now go forth and let's make things happen, y'all.
as well. Amazing. Made it easy. Yeah. Great job, Ryan. Good job, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. 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 Good